This is going to be an overview of the book of Deuteronomy. And this is yet another overlooked, underread, underrated, and amazing book in the Bible. There are so many cool stories in this book. But why is this book called Deuteronomy? If you look at the first part of the word, Deuter means second. Onomy means law. So this book is the second giving of the law. And the parents of the first generation of Israel, who weren't going to go into the land, failed to teach their kids the law, so Moses has to go back over it with them. That is the problem of many parents today still, is they are failing to give their children the Bible. They're not going over the Bible with their children. But this book has 34 chapters, 959 verses, and 28,352 words. It's a pretty long book. But if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 1 verses 2 and 3, it says there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the 40th year in the 11th month on the first day of the month that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. So look at that. It takes Israel 40 years to take an 11 days journey. And the purpose of God allowing them to wander these 40 years is so that the first generation would die off. Because that first generation was rebellious and they got too comfortable and got too satisfied and would not go in to possess the land. So they have to wander for 40 years for the second generation to come up so that they can go in to possess the land. And that's like your Christian life. You don't want to get too comfortable and too satisfied with how you feel about yourself as a Christian. You don't want to think, well, I already know enough about the Bible, so I'm just going to stop here, or I've done prayed enough, I done know enough. You want to keep on pursuing to know God more, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to get too complacent and satisfied. So this illustrates something great about our salvation. The first generation doesn't get to go into the land, and the second one does. In our life, our first birth, which when we was born of our mother, wasn't any good. But the second birth is what got us in. And that is when you get born again. The moment you believe the gospel, that's your second birth. If you're born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you die once, or not at all if... The rapture happens before you die. So the fact that Israel went in to possess, the, didn't go in to possess the land, but the second generation went in to possess it, that's a great picture of our salvation. And you have many people today in their Christian life who are just wandering around. They aren't doing anything. They've been saved 40 years, and all they have ever done is go to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. They haven't learned anything. They haven't taught anything. They have nothing to pass down to the next generation. They have been led to believe that the true mark of spirituality is church attendance. And a good portion of preaching you here today will be about that subject, church attendance. But what about the rest of the Bible? We need to pass the Bible down to our kids. We need to make them interested in the Bible. We need to make them love the Bible. In chapters 1 through 4, you have Moses going through and reviewing the wilderness journeys. In chapters 5 through 7, it goes back over the Ten Commandments. And 5 through 26 is a second giving of the law. And 27 through 34, it warns them to stay faithful and prepare for their inheritance. So with that brief little outline, let's look. A little bit closer at the book of Deuteronomy. So the book of Deuteronomy shows us Christ as the prophet like unto Moses. Remember how I told you in each book you'll see something about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Deuteronomy shows us is Jesus the prophet like unto Moses. If you look at Deuteronomy 15 through 19, <clears throat> it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me unto him ye shall hearken 
So there you have it. Moses himself said, there's going to be a prophet like him that the Lord's going to raise up. And Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses, according to Acts 7.37 and John 1.45. So let's go ahead and look at some amazing parts of this book. And maybe at the end we'll go over some similarities between Jesus and Moses. Now Deuteronomy 3.11 says, For only Og, king of Bashan, or Bashan remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Raboth, Raboth of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof, after the cubit of a man. Did you know the Bible has a lot to say about giants? There has been many stories made by man about giants. And the idea of a little guy versus a big guy is something that people just love to see. You see it in all the movies. A little guy versus a big guy, an underdog story. But the Bible originated that plot. In the book of Deuteronomy, you'll see where it was the Lord that was with Israel and allowed them to win these battles against people greater and mightier. In chapter 6, the law is to be obeyed taught to children. If they keep it faithfully, then God would bless them. In the first verse of Deuteronomy 6, it says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land, whether you go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Then verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. So you see, one of the most important things... Your greatest ministry is teaching your kids and your family the Word of God, making that be the center of everything in your home. Have the Word of God everywhere. Have it playing on an audio Bible. Have Bibles in every room so it's always in close reach. You know, play something Bible-related in the car like preaching. You know, take your kids to church. Let them hear the preaching in person. Play preaching on YouTube. You know, everywhere you go... Make it about the Word of God. Make it about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this way, your kids will grow up with God on their mind. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 7, the Lord talks about seven nations greater and mightier than Israel. And even though they are greater and mightier, the Lord is going to deliver them into Israel's hand. You see, Israel looks so uh, tough and things many times in the Bible, but it's really the Lord that's tough. It's really the Lord that's bringing them through it because the other people are mightier. They're stronger. Many times had more people, probably most of the time. Just like the world is greater and mightier than Christians today. Looking out at this world, this is a big world. There's most lost people, probably smarter than me, stronger than me, richer than me. But the lost world is not going to overcome the Christian because... The Christian has God. And 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Jesus can handle anything. The flesh, the world, the devil. He, he can handle it all. There's nothing too great for God. But the Lord goes on to say in Deuteronomy chapter 7 that Israel should not make a covenant with the people in these wicked nations. He explains how their children will turn away from following the Lord because of that negative influence for sin and the devil <clears throat> and fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. And that's why the New Testament says evil communications corrupt good manners. And notice how God feels about the things of these heathen nations. It says in Deuteronomy 7, 5, But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn down their graven images with fire. Look at these words he's using. He says destroy, break down, cut down, and burn. 
God's not okay with the images. Even today, it's not. Okay. He's not okay with pornographic images. He's not okay with Instagram images that depict something sinful and that are all about self. We should destroy, break down, cut down, burn anything in our life that is keeping us from looking like God's people. If your CD case is full of wicked music, you need to break those things. Throw them in the trash. Make sure nobody else picks them up out of the trash. I remember when I first got saved, I had like a thousand CDs that were just sinful music. And I threw them away in the trash. And I was like, I hope nobody came behind me and picked those up and started listening to them or something. Break them. Get rid of them. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Lord wants them to remember what he did for them and how he brought them through a wilderness of fiery serpents and scorpions and, and drought. He gave them water out of a rock. And Paul also says to, for us to remember some things in the New Testament. He says in 2 Timothy 2.8, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So Jesus Christ was died on the cross for our sins, was buried and resurrected. Jesus Christ became the serpent on a pole. He felt the sting of death. He felt the thirst on the cross. Remember what he did for you on the cross and how he rose from the dead. And this will help you live right if you remember these things. You need to remember these things. One of the paths to becoming unthankful is not remembering what the Lord's done for you. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, the Lord lets Israel know that it isn't because of their personal righteousness that they get to go to the land, but for the Father's sake. He says in Deuteronomy 9, 6, Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. And did you know, just like for us today, it isn't because of our righteousness that you are saved or God's or just because God likes you or something. It's God's grace and mercy. It's because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that you're saved. Because you can't do anything good enough to make God like you enough to go to heaven. It's all about what Jesus did and how you got his righteousness the moment you believe the gospel. Ephesians 4.32 talks about how for Christ's sake he forgave you. It's not of your own righteousness that you get to go to heaven. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 10, it talks about new tablets of stone that the Lord writes the Ten Commandments on again. And this is God's mind on stone, just like the Bible is God's mind on paper. He didn't forget his word the first time, so he wrote them again. Just like it's very possible for him to make another copy, and then another copy, and then another copy, and just preserve the words he writes all the way down to the, where we're at today. God hasn't lost his word. He promised to preserve his word in Psalms 12, and that's what he's continuing to do. And then in Deuteronomy 11, it talks about loving and serving God. In Deuteronomy 11, 1, it says, thou, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and keep his charge, and his statutes, and his judgments, and his commandments always. And if you look in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 8, 3 says, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. In 1 John 5, 2 it says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So the more you love God, the more you'll live right. The more you fear God, the more you'll live right and serve God. So you see that all the way through the Bible about loving God. <clears throat> if you love God and love other people, that'll keep you from sin. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, you can see how bad the Lord hates a land polluted with false gods in deuteronomy 12 2 and 3 it says you shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess served their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree and you shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire and you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place in deuteronomy 13 and take note of the number 13 in the Bible because it is many times associated with rebellion and wicked men. But in chapter 13, the Lord talks about false prophets who show signs and wonders. If you look at Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3, 
It says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. So the false prophet and antichrist will deceive with signs and wonders in the tribulation. And the Antichrist is also connected with that number 13. So it's interesting that it talks about these false prophets here in Deuteronomy 13. But you're warned against the false prophet. In Deuteronomy 14, the Lord goes on to talk about clean and unclean foods. And in the New Testament, we are at liberty to eat what we, should, what we would like to eat. Not like Israel here in, in the book of Deuteronomy. But for us, in Colossians 2.16, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. So Deuteronomy talks about rules for having a Hebrew man or a woman slave in chapter 15. And it's an interesting story. It says, And if thy brother, an Hebrew man, or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years. Then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock, and out of thy floor, and out of thy winepress, of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give it unto him. And thou shalt remember that, the, that thou wast a bondman, in the land of Egypt. And the Lord thy God redeemed thee, therefore I command thee this thing today. And it shall be, if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee in thine house, because he is well with thee, then thou shalt take an awl and thrust it through his ear unto the door, and he shall be thy servant forever. And also unto thy ma maidservant thou shalt do likewise. So he could go free after six years, and then if he decides he wants to stay, so that shows, you know, servants are treated well because, I mean, they might decide to stay. Then they take and pierce his ear. Maybe this is where you get the idea for ear piercing. I don't know. But in Deuteronomy 16, it talks about some feasts like the Passover. And at the end of the chapter, it talks about forbidden forms of worship. In Deuteronomy 16, 21 through 22, it says, says, Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. Neither shalt thou set thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. Notice that the Lord just continues to talk about these images throughout the Bible. He hates these images. In Numbers, it talks about pic certain pictures. And that's what everybody still is about. You know, you got images. And the movies are just moving images. <coughs> <coughs> so, you know, you need to get rid of these wicked images. See, the images help you sin. Because when you have dirty thoughts, it's because of those images you've put in your mind. And then in chapter 18, the Lord shows some forbidden practices. In Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12, it says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found in, among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, that's like child sacrifice, or that useth divination or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So all the witchcraft, the psychics, foretelling the future through occult means, abortion, or any type of child sacrifice is forbidden in the Bible. And here in chapter 18, we see the main thing in Deuteronomy. And that's where I, what I talked about before where it says the lord thy god will raise thee up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me unto him you shall hearken so jesus is the prophet like unto moses and without me going through the entire book you can already see how amazing the book is so to close out this quick overview of deuteronomy i want to show you the main thing about the book the main thing is the prophet like unto Moses, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to give you many ways that Moses illustrates the Lord Jesus. 
No. Number one, Moses and Jesus were born at a time when in Israel was in bondage to someone. And when Moses was born, they were in bondage to Egypt. When Jesus was born, they were in bondage to the Romans. Number two, babies were being killed when Moses and Jesus were born. Pharaoh and Herod were both killing babies. Number three, both spent time in the wilderness before starting their ministry. Number four, both Moses and Jesus were shepherds. Number five, Moses and Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days. See Exodus 34, 28 and Luke 4, 2. Uh, both Moses and Jesus Christ for, were known for being humble and meek. In Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek. And Matthew 21, 5 describes Jesus Christ as a meek king. Uh, number 7, in Psalms 106, 16, it talks about how Moses was envied. And as you know, they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ because of envy. See Matthew 27, 18. Moses and Jesus Christ have connection through the law because John 1, 17 says, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And Matthew 5, 17 says, that Jesus came to fulfill the law. Number nine, both of them were sent to Israel. As you know, Moses was sent to deliver Israel from the bondage of Egypt. In Exodus 3.10, it says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And you know what it says about Jesus Christ. In John 1.11, he came into his own, Israel, and his own received him not. Number 10, both Moses and Jesus Christ did something big with a large body of water. Moses parted the Red Sea. The Lord Jesus Christ calmed the storm and walked on water. Number 11, people were fed miraculously under the care of Moses and Jesus Christ. In Exodus 16, the Lord drops manna from heaven. And in Mark 8, 1 through 9, Jesus Christ feeds the 4,000. Number 12, both quenched people's thirst miraculously. In Exodus 15, 22 through 23, Moses gives drink to thirsty people. In John 4, 10, Jesus describes how he can give a person living water. In Matthew 17, both Jesus and Moses met each other on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, at 14, both Moses and Jesus Christ had outstretched arms with a man on each side. Moses had this happen during the war with Amalek where you had him up on the mountain there, and he's got his outstretched arms. And when he, as long as he's got them arms up, then you know Israel gets the victory. And then Jesus Christ had this happen during his spiritual war on Calvary with outstretched arms, and he had a man on each side just like Moses. Now Moses and Jesus Christ didn't stay in their burial places after they died. This would be number 15. Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead and left the tomb in his glorified body. And then Moses in Deuteronomy 34, 5 through 6, it says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. So Moses and Jesus Christ didn't stay in their burial places after they died. Number 16, both men had people wondering about their dead bodies after they died. In the book of Jude, the devil and Michael, the archangel, disputed about the body of Moses. And then in Matthew 28, 11 through 15, the soldiers are paid to lie about where Jesus' body went. So, so many similarities, so many types and pictures we see of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible. But this has been an overview of the book of Deuteronomy, and I'm doing these hopefully to spark some interest in people's mind about the Bible, about the Word of God. I want you to read it and study it. Just pick it up and read it. Just grab the book of Deuteronomy and read it. I hope this got you excited to read this particular book.